Well, welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to have you today to this webinar on Ukraine, peace building, nonviolent resistance, and unarmed civilian protection. My name is Eli McCarthy. I'm a Just Peace Fellow at the Franciscan Action Network. And our process today is we will start with a, a brief prayer and then have kind of an interview sort of dialogue process with our three panelists. Uh, they'll be answering various questions and kind of responding to each other. And then we'll open it up for audience questions and comments uh, about the last 10 or 15 minutes of the session. So um, I want to start here and see um, and begin with our prayer. Um, Marie Dennis is not on, correct? Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with prayer. This is a special prayer that Pope Francis wrote, uh, a prayer to end the war in Ukraine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, forgive us for war, O Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, sinners. Lord Jesus, born in the shadows of bombs falling on Kiev, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, who died in a mother's arms in a bunker in Kharkiv, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, a 20-year-old sent to the front lines, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, who still behold armed hands in the shadow of your cross, have mercy on us. Forgive us, O Lord. Forgive us if we are not satisfied with the nails with which we crucified your hands as we continue to slate our thirst with the blood of those mauled by weapons. Forgive us if these hands which you created to tend have been transformed into instruments of death. Forgive us if we continue to kill our brother. Forgive us if we continue like Cain to pick up the stones of our fields to kill Abel. Forgive us if we continue to justify our cruelty with our labors, if we legitimize the brutality of our actions with our pain. Forgive us for war, O Lord. Forgive us for war, O Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you, hold fast the hand of Cain. Illumine our consciences. May our will not be done, abandon us not to our own actions. Stop us, O oh Lord, stop us. And when you have held back the hand of Cain, care also for him. He is our brother. O oh Lord, put a halt to the violence. Stop us, O oh Lord. Amen. So as we enter into this conversation, this critical conversation today, just to remind ourselves of the some recent context where Pope Francis has publicly declared a peace mission, has recently met with the president of Ukraine, and has also identified a papal envoy to Ukraine and to Russia. The other diplomatic efforts happening from six African leaders, leaders of countries coming to promote diplomacy, leaders of Brazil, Hungary, and China, all promoting diplomacy. After this webinar, we will have another webinar in the, likely in June on diplomatic opportunities and the role of narratives and propaganda in the war. So today I wanna to begin with our three wonderful guests, Father Mike Lasky, who is working on peace building in Ukraine, Professor Philippe Daza, who will be talking about his activity, his research on nonviolent resistance in Ukraine, and Kalista Bupri, who is with the Nonviolent Peace Force. 
and she is an advocacy director for their work who have deployed unarmed civilian protection units in Ukraine. So let's begin with this first question, a little bit about yourselves. What led you to the role that you have today? So Father Mike, what led you to become a priest engaged in peace building? You can unmute Father Mike. There we go. I can be taught. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, as a friar, I, for Franciscans, all of us, uh, were called to preach peace. This was a key part of the charism that Francis birthed into the church and into the world. And for us, in preaching peace, it's not just the, 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 the words that we say, but it's the actions that we do as well. And for Francis of Assisi, and for me personally, it's rooted in the Lord. It's rooted in Jesus, which we find uh, particularly spoken about in Paul's letter to the Ephesians when he says, Jesus came to preach peace so that people would no longer be strangers, no longer be foreigners. And for him, it has its roots in the apostles. Uh, we hear about how, for instance, Mary Magdalene was known as the apostle to the apostles, the one who announced the good news of the resurrection to them. Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. Interestingly enough, John Paul II uh, in uh, his pontificate, took the person of Francis of Assisi and gave him a new title, the Apostle of the Gospel of Peace. And this peacefulness that Francis proclaimed so boldly in his life, and the friars tried to do as well in me and my ministry, uh, finds its, for me, an expression in the pastoral letter from Appalachia called The Telling Takes Us Home. And in there, it speaks several times about how is it that we bring the resurrection to the crucified places of the world? And for me, that image is a very powerful one. So that's the heart of what brings me to preaching peace and doing peace building in my ministry now, uh, which is general delegate for the Franciscan uh, friars around the world for peace, justice, and care for creation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Mike. We appreciate your your work and the Franciscan community more broadly. Philippe, tell us what led you to become a professor and to research nonviolent action? Well, before before to be a professor, I, I started to become a, a practitioner of nonviolence. So I started to basically to, to work and to, to be part of nonviolent movements, um, maybe more than yeah, 15 years ago. Uh, First time was in Palestine, and they're you know working with uh, uh, Palestinians that were resisting under occupation. Then I started to cooperate in 2006 with uh, one network in Iraq. It was called Laonf against the sectarian uh, violence. And in 2012, I started also to just be engaged with uh, uh, activists from Belarus and also Ukraine. So I I was involved in the in the Revolution of Dignity in 2013. In, in Kiev, and this was the beginning of my relation with uh, with Ukraine. And when the when the invasion started, I was uh, I was professor at that time in the uh, Kiev Mohil Academy University, uh, and uh, I was basically teaching nonviolence, well, peace and conflict studies and nonviolence with uh, seventy students. And, and and the war started, the second stage of the war. So we decided to engage in a, in the report on on mapping non resistance in, in Ukraine. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're so excited to hear more about uh, this report and the research. Calista, um, welcome. We're glad you're with us. Uh, what what led you to to now be a, an advocate for the nonviolent peace force and the work to support unarmed civilian protection? Thank you. Thanks, Eli, and thank you to the Franciscan Action Network for having me here on behalf of Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, my role that I have now with Nonviolent Peace Force really arose out of um, several years ago when I worked with Nonviolent Peace Force in South Sudan as an international protection officer. Um, I had been looking for an opportunity to, you know, really work in the kind of the nexus between 
humanitarian development and peace building using the academic background that I had up to that point. Um, but I really wanted to find something that uh, lived out the do no harm principles, um, which go into how aid can either support peace or um, unintentionally support war. And when I discovered nonviolent peace force, I really um, just connected with uh, its mission and its modality of using both local national actors with international actors together um, to use unarmed civilian uh, protection strategies um, to just help communities who are affected by violent conflict. And I always, I, you know, left that role after three years, but um, couldn't leave, you know, that connection to those communities. And so I looked for another opportunity that um, came about this year to get involved again with Nonviolent Peace Force and really uh, lift up the work that it's doing uh, within the U.S. in this advocacy role. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, we're so excited to hear more about the work in Ukraine. Nonviolent Peace Force is the largest unarmed civilian protection organization uh, in the world, really uh, setting out the, the path for how we can scale up this, uh, this practice. So Father Mike, um, tell us more about this kind of peace building that you're engaged in regarding Ukraine. What What's happening? What are sort of the characteristics? Back last year in Holy Week, I went to Poland to see what I could do to help with the situation of the refugees. And I realized that the friars and so many others were doing all the corporal and spiritual works of mercy without fault. They were great at what they're doing. They're still doing it. The one thing that was really missing, though, they just didn't have a capacity for, and it was dealing with the trauma of the people that they were experiencing uh, coming through their doors. And uh, that led one thing to another, and I knew that our Capuchin brothers had a social theater, um, Franciscan social theater program, uh, which had been used in parts of Africa and Albania, uh, been used in prisons. It's it's all about conflict resolution, how you deal with trauma based on people's different situations. So I talked to the director, Stefano Luca, um, a Capuchin here in uh, Milan, and he said that he'd been wanting to do something in Ukraine but didn't quite know how. So he contacted the secular Franciscans in Ukraine, and one of them happens to be an actress, which was perfect. So she got a bunch of friends who were actors and actresses we brought them all to Poland into a safe place, and we spent two weeks uh, training them, basically using the skills, the abilities that they already have through going through school for acting and theater and what have you, and refocus those skills and abilities in such a way that they could work primarily with children, though they work with adults as well, in um, helping to address their issues around trauma caused by the war. It's not a fix. It's really um, helping them not to get stuck by using their words, their actions, by expressing their emotions. Uh, they're able to um, uh, still function and be able to come to some health and, um, and continue to live their life in difficult situations. So uh, it was a very successful program, to say the least. After the two-week training, we sent them back uh, into their home. Some went back into Ukraine and some in different parts of Poland uh, to begin setting up programs. And we met with them again on the border of Ukraine in one of our friaries six months later to review all their programs, see how it went. Uh, and we continue to help them online to this day. So it's been a nonstop process for us from beginning to end. We were hoping, in all honesty, with nine participants, we were hoping for maybe about five projects to be born. And when we came back together this past uh, uh, February, they had finished 11 projects and were planning more and actually now setting up a uh, social theater network throughout Ukraine. So we were very happy with the success of this. And actually, I just got back. I spent the first two weeks of May doing the same program in Lebanon for Syrians who are suffering from the war and the earthquake there. Uh, we were so successful in Ukraine, we thought we should get going right away with the next project. Um, what are the types of projects that they're working on, you're probably asking? Um, 
they work with autistic children in Poland. There was another one with uh, refugees who were blind, children who were blind and young adults. When they're taken out of their environment, uh, it becomes very difficult. And the exercises that we do and teach them have certainly helped. Um, there are other projects in Kyiv where, uh, if you could imagine, one of the things that we tell the, uh, uh, the participants in our training is you have to have a holy flexibility about you. You need to be able to look around and use what you have. And one of them took this to heart because she's now teaching social theater in a school, 13 to 16 year olds. And when the sirens sound, they have to go to the basement. And the first time they were there, she had been in the middle of the class. She said, I got down there and I realized my class just grew really large. It was almost the whole school. And I was going to keep teaching down there to take their minds off of the sirens and focus them on something else. Um, so small things like that to um, programs in Kharkiv after the Russians deoccupied uh, to bring a Christmas pageant there and to just bring some normalcy and a little bit of hope uh, mm -hmm. to folks who don't know where their family members are, if they died or even went through the Russian filtration camps. Uh, so um, our folks have been dealing with a lot of issues themselves. Um, but I think the good thing is we do it in the context of spirituality. A spirituality, especially Franciscan spirituality, that brings a holy flexibility to uh, what they're doing and a creativity. And um, with their connection to the Lord and one another, um, I think we're bringing some hope and some healing into some very difficult spaces. Oh, wonderful. It's so amazing. Um, right. Just have a, a little bit of an inkling. What can I do? Make a connection, start some things, some people come, and then it just starts to blossom right and those you kind of throw the stone in the water and the ripples go out and um sounds like some amazing healing and transformation really can inspire us to think about how we can support that kind of practice and others as well so philippe could you um unpack a little bit uh, this nonviolent action report came out in october of 2022 uh, Pretty large report. I think you had what 235 nonviolent actions or so. You interviewed around 60 people, and um, you know, most robust report we we've seen on nonviolent action in Ukraine. Um, tell us what were some prominent examples uh, in this report? Yes. Um, well, I mean, these uh, 235 actions. Um, I mean, it's just the peak of the iceberg. Um, we are still systematizing more actions, like actions in Donetsk that, and actions in the Kherson, Zaporizhia. So with other nonviolent activists, we are sharing information. And, and in fact, this report is like a some kind of dynamic report. So we are still collecting information and uh, collecting uh, interviews with uh, different uh, activists. Because I think this information is very important also to capit capitalize the nonviolence experience of Ukraine. But I would say that the, the, some of the first actions that we systematized were like the physical interposition, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, spontaneous uh, local residents trying to stop uh, tanks in Chernihiv um, or military convoys in the south that, in fact, were very effective in terms of, you know, like uh, avoiding that the, the Russians cross the, the cities and in some way, you know, slow down the process to or the way to, to Kiev. Um, but we, I would like to say that the, we have also a big number of actions connected with uh, symbolic actions, demonstrations, protests, uh, and especially, for example, in the city of Kherson, the science the occupation, there were daily uh, protests uh, in, in the city, and and the and the majority of these actions were uh, they were the, the local residents that were using uh, Ukrainian flags, as we we observe. Uh, flags from the ethnic minorities, like Tatar Crimeans. And there were a, a lot of uh, symbols from the Ukrainian, you know, uh, the folklore. And I think that so it reflects the importance to understand that uh, non-violence in Ukraine is connected also with cultural resistance. So there is a very important uh, relation between the, the aim, the motivation of the Ukrainian people to consolidate also their, their Ukrainian identity. Um, I think that this is very important because these actions were under occupation and in the middle of the war. So the risk was very high for, for the protests, for the people. 
but also show you know as uh, in a way the the, the courage you know, of the people. This this is a very interesting case that we recorded and it's, it happened in Slavutic, which is the is is well known because it's the is the town of the workers of Chernobyl. So it's a town that is very close to the border in border to Belarus, Belarus and. On March uh, 26, the, the Russians occupy were well, entering into the city, and the, the 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 local residents organized themselves. In 15, 20 minutes, there were hundreds of people in the in the main square, with flags again singing, and and there they gather in the main square, and they they start moving, you know, to the direction of the of the Russians. The Russians start to to shoot to the air, and even there were some people inj injured as well. Um, but the, the, the people we interviewed them because we went to uh, in April we were there to, to collect the interviews to the to the activists. They told us that they, they, they looked to the faces of the Russians and they didn't expect this reaction. Like people, you know, advancing to them with flags and singing with the smiles. And these uh, you know hundreds of people, you know, advancing to the to the Russians. In a, it was the it's a actual reflection of the, the power of nonviolence. So this uh, this is strength um, force. Uh, negotiation with the Russians. There was a process the, that the, it happened that there was in one line with the Russian soldiers, and the other line was the um, the, the, the the Ukrainian residents plus the the municipality, the at uh, the local council, and they, they entered into negotiations to liberate the major who was kidnapped uh, hours before, and also to leave the city uh, two days later. So this is also uh, an example. Uh, mm -hmm. about the, the strength of nonviolence. And this is just, again, this is the peak of the iceberg because now we are also recording also similar stories also in Donetsk and Luhansk. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would be still we are trying to, to record uh, and basically to collect more information about uh, uh, more dialogue, more uh, 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 activities of uh, fraternization with uh, the Russians. We know that in the occupied areas there were also some cases of uh, uh, Dialogue with the with the with the soldiers to liberate civilians. They were also uh, detained. They were in meditation, and it was very success, successful. So, so I think this is a, the some you know, they, let's say, very important stories, no, of nonviolence in the in, in the under occupation and the under war. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing, right? Like, who could imagine when there's tanks and there's missiles and there's shooting and all sorts of fear and uncertainty, right? That there are people in the midst of this with the spontaneity, the creativity, the courage to try something, to try nonviolent action and with their bodies, with demonstrations, with evacuating people, protecting, negotiating with the invading soldiers, right? Like that's amazing. This isn't something that is just for after the war ends or just to try to stop the war from happening, but it's occurring in the midst of uh, the drama, the trauma as well. Anything else you wanna say about the impacts or kind of what you found about uh, from your more recent trips or? Yes, well, I mean, there is a, a, in terms of impact, um, well, I was explaining just here, this story is that I think there's also another type of actions that were very successful and it's the non-cooperation actions. So we have also uh, um, several cases of non-cooperation, like for example, like uh, workers that refused to, to to work with the Russians to build infrastructures in in Kherson, um, teachers in Melitopol in in the in Zaporizhia that they refused to to teach the, the Russian syllabus under occupation, or uh, civil servants, uh, public workers that refused to. To, uh, to provide the, the census to the uh, to the Russians to organize the several referendums. And in fact, these non-cooperation actions were very effective to, let's say, to undermine the, um, the military goals of the Russians to establish the, a military administrative, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, system uh, in the occupation, in, in the occupied areas. Um, Apart from that, I think it's also very inter interesting to see that the, all these demonstrations in the, in the urban areas were also very effective in terms of, let's say, um, diversifying the, the, the military goals of the Russians. The Russians had like two fronts. One it was to, to fight the, the Ukrainian army, but also to control the urban areas. So now that we have Sony is liberated, you know, like uh, where people could think that uh, it was thanks to the, you know, all to, the, to the army, to the Ukrainian army. 
but in fact the people is, is still is uh, uh, is a, is not enough analysis and it's not enough information about the power of non-violence especially for the local residents you know in these occupied areas you know to to confront the uh, the, the the occupation for example like uh, when the repression increased in these occupied areas um the non-violence became invisible so there was a uh, you know, several act invisible actions, clandestine actions. Like, for example, there was the is the the yellow and, and blue ribbon campaign that there was at, at night. People start you know to to hold and to and to, to stick you know ribbons in the public spaces. They start to withdraw the the Russian and the Soviet flags from the public uh, public buildings or making graffitis uh, like Kherson is uh, is Ukraine. So these invisible actions were also very important, which it shows. The flexibility and adaptability of nonviolence also to the different contexts is what you mentioned. So nonviolence has a very important role, not in the pre-conflict situation or the post-conflict, but also in the in the middle of the crisis. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so let's turn to uh, Calista from Nonviolent Peace Force. You know what what is Nonviolent Peace Force able to do in the midst of war? How, what is unarmed civilian protection? look like and what have some been some of the impacts that you all have discovered yeah um so unarmed civilian protection or ucp as we call it is really kind of a suite of strategies or tools um, that focus on pre preventing violence direct protection on increasing safety and security and on um, really building up and strengthening local peace infrastructures. And there is a lot that that can do in the midst of an active conflict situation such as in Ukraine. Um, so our teams, since they've been in, have really focused um, their efforts on helping to kind of increase the safety and security for civilians who are trying to access humanitarian services. Um, and that has meant working really closely with um, many of the local um, civil society organizations or volunteer collectives on the front lines who have been doing um, really most of the front line work of this. Um, a lot of those groups, you know, started out in, um, you know, last year and they're volunteer, they ran, they've been running out of resources or they've been um, burning out or they haven't had the adequate um, gear to safely you know, go in a front lines area um, and they're continuing their work anyway, um, bringing out some of the most vulnerable civilians who haven't been able to evacuate on their own. Um, or they've also been going in and providing support to civilians such as maybe elderly people who are choosing to remain in place rather than evacuate. Um, so our teams have been able to connect with these groups um, and really come alongside them in a really trust-based relationship to, uh, they've developed a loaning system for personal protective equipment. Um, they also, for aid kits, they've um, signed uh, MOUs that have allowed for fuel stipends and other resources to allow the groups to continue. Um, and uh, they've also done a lot of uh, mental health and um, psychosocial support training. Um, interestingly, our team in Ukraine that has done so much of that, um, you know, mental first aid, mental health first aid, were actually able to provide an online training to our team in Sudan um, just in the last month to help them respond to the conflict in Sudan. And they've already, that team in Sudan has already gone on to train over 100 civilians in Sudan. So, um, you know, our teams are really able to help each other that way. So the, the teams, the MP teams in Ukraine have, um, you know, supported the local groups this way. They've also really acted as a connector, um, helping to build bridges between other international organizations and local groups. Um, for instance, the uh, the humanitarian aid was being delivered and left at the edges of oblasts where the international actors felt it was not safe enough for them to go in to distribute it. And then it was being left for you know local communities or groups to have to figure out how to distribute. Um, and NP has been able to 
help make those connections so that um, the burden and the high level of risk is not only being left on the local communities, um, but that they're getting the support and information they need to be able to make that humanitarian assistance more safely available for their communities. Mm -hmm. um, the PPE lending, the personal protective equipment lending has been really effective. There's a case study that's coming out on our website soon, um, telling the story recently of a volunteer group that got caught in a shelling in the midst of one of their um, efforts and were saved by the PPE equipment that they had gotten from Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, and this has been something that has been lacking from some other um, international partners being able to provide for these protection needs of their local partners. Um, and just in general, Nonviolent Peace Force, you know, it sends in trained unarmed civilian protection officers who come alongside the communities who as Philippe is you know, telling stories, have many capacities of their own to help protect them, to help act um, nonviolently. And um, so our teams continue to do that and to provide whatever capacity building um, is necessary to help really just strengthen those local structures and those local capacities, um, because there's a lot mm -hmm. that civilians can do to help protect mm -hmm. themselves. Okay, thank you so much. So we're gonna we'll send out an email with resources to these reports and uh, the information about NP and Father Mike's work. Um, I want to invite the panelists now to kind of think a little bit about how your different sets of practices complement each other, right? How does peace building complement nonviolent resistance and unarmed protection complement peace building and so forth? And how is that related to generating a more sustainable peace in the midst of hostile conflict? So I also invite the audience to be thinking about that. Like, what is this, uh, the relationship between these practices? And we'll come to you in a few minutes with your general questions and comments. But let me turn it over to the panelists here and, and open it up in terms of your reflections on how these practices complement each other, how can they enhance each other, and really how does it relate to building a more or generating a more sustainable peace? So anybody can start, obviously. I can jump in if um, I'm not cutting anyone off. Uh, so I enjoyed that question um, when you gave it to us, Eli, to kind of think about ahead of time, um, because I just think it's having these different types of, of approaches really just shows how um, broad um, the work of peace can be and how many options there are and how, um, you know, it's a, a sort of, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, like an ecosystem where there's different types that can really support um, and work in different ways to to really cover whatever situation is coming up. Um, I see the um, unarmed civilian protection really complementing peace building activities in that um, it can be utilized in really actively um, violent co conflict contexts and providing um, that direct protection aspects um, when people are, you know, really under threat of, of imminent violence and can, um, you know, mitigate or deter it. Um, I see it really complementing nonviolent resistance as um, sort of wrapping around um, while the community is resisting, you know, what is being perhaps imposed on them. There's also the other elements that UCP can bring to help address the other needs of the community while that conflict is going on. Um, like I was giving the example of trying to access the humanitarian assistance or um, UCP actors in some contexts take part in ceasefire monitoring. Um, it just has a real variety of applications and um, is stronger in a context like Ukraine where these other peace building activities and nonviolent resistance activities are also taking place. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. So unarmed protection, right, can contribute to the safety of nonviolent resistance organizers and participants, as well as those who are um, facilitating peace building or engage in peace building practices, trauma healing sessions, and so forth. And even more deeply, right, unarmed protection kind of humanizes the dynamic in the space and humanizes the parties involved as well, which is critical to kind of breaking out of the cycle of dehumanization and war and, and so forth. So Father Mike or Philippe, what, what are your reflections on kind of how these things mm -hmm. complement each other? Yes, well, I think... Mean, ah, sorry. Ah, Go ahead, Father Mike. Yeah, uh, well, make it least. for me, looking at social theater, it's something very specific where we're working with folks uh, in, in particular, normally through social theater, um, uh, like a drama, a play or something that a group is working toward to express for the community and through the exercises, they process their trauma. So that does two things for us that I think touch the other topics of, to, of this uh, discussion. First, it's an opportunity in a safe place through stories, which are oftentimes rewritten by the members, take a piece of Shakespeare or any other part of literature that they would be acting out. And we can explore topics around nonviolent resistance and how that's been done in other places in the past and what that looks like. And in the safety of that, the participants can explore that and look at that and perhaps even uh, practice that as they move forward. But in addition to that, we always re remind our trainees, uh, our facilitators that they're not therapists and don't go down that road or get stuck in that space because it both puts you and the person that you're trying to help into a bad space. So make sure you have partners on the ground who can help you to do that when things start to manifest themselves. And we've seen that happen in a number of our uh, trainings already in Ukraine and in Poland, where because we partnered with local psychologists who could assist, um, all of a sudden feelings of anger. I think uh, it, particularly in central Ukraine, where a lot of folks have been relocated from the east and they only speak Russian, but they're mm -hmm. Ukrainian. And what's the, how do they integrate into that society? And our programs have helped them to do that because people were feeling marginalized. Local conflicts just amongst people, fights were starting to happen. And we were able to explore those feelings and look at that and begin to name those things. And then in this one town in particular, everybody realized, oh, we have a psychologist that's actually available to us. <laughs> Let's start to access that. And we helped to give them sort of the, uh, the confidence to be able to, to engage at that level. So those resources are super important for us. Um, I think a difference is a, a lot of our work, and this is one of the first times in Franciscan social theater that we're going into an active situation by sending people into it, training them just outside of it. Uh, so for us, we're really waiting for the war to end so that we could go in and start our work and start establishing larger programs uh, throughout Ukraine itself. But to be able to host a, uh, a training is difficult for us in the midst of a war, um, mm -hmm. to say the least. So we're doing our best that we can to train just across the border and, uh, and sort of get a head start. Great. Thank you so much. Right. And there's been a lot of really amazing research on peace building and nonviolent resistance and how peace building can help create the conditions for nonviolent resistance to have more of an impact. Like if you have people with less trauma, then they're better able to participate in nonviolent resistance movements and develop wise strategy and so forth. I would uh, just say one last thing real quick is that um, when I was just in Lebanon with the Syrians, uh, at one point a conversation came up where they were asking something about their faith and this scripture passage about Jesus saying, you know, if someone slaps you on the cheek, offer another. And very quickly, I sort of explained to them what that meant was you always use your right hand. The first slap is that with the back of the hand. So the person's a slave, has no dignity. So Jesus is saying, offer the other cheek. So they're forced to use their open palm. And as a result, in Jesus's culture, you only do that for someone who's an equal. So it's sort of standing up and saying, I'm not a doormat. It's not a doormat theology. It's mm -hmm. a respect my dignity, respect the fact that I'm a human person in a nonviolent way. 
And I remember one of the um, participants uh, from Aleppo, she looks over at me and she goes, now that's my Jesus. <laughs> and, and so there's just, they're looking for those points of reference uh, that they can use uh, to strengthen them. Sometimes they're just not available or known to them. Mm -hmm. All right. So Philippe, maybe last comment, and then we'll open it up to questions here. What's your sense of mm -hmm. this complementarity between these practices and how that's critical to a more sustainable peace? Yes. No, I, I, I completely agree with Michael uh, that one of the main challenges today in Ukraine is the social polarization. I mean, there are uh, ongoing, like, uh, conflicts at the community level between IDPs and the hosted communities, even, you know, conflicts within, within families. So I see that the, something that is happening today in Ukraine is that the, the um, non-violent activists are using the stories of non-violence, the stories of resistance, as an opportunity of reencounter between people. For example, in liberated areas like in Kherson, in the, they are creating a, a, a spaces for dialogue, for reconciliation, you know, to discuss the issues of collaborators and other, you know, sensitive topics, and they are using the stories of non-violence to see, to talk about resistance, to talk about reencounter, uh, to talk as opportunity to reencounter and to to build to have a common base, a common ground. Um, another area or another intersection, in my opinion, is the relation between non-violence and and democracy or democratic pra uh, practices. Non-violence is is based on community organizing, so. All non-violence uh, actions are have a very strong, uh, you know, are rooted, you know, with a, a very important community organizing work by, you know, uh, uh, volunteers, by uh, local residents, by, uh, you know, um, NGOs and other organizations. Uh, these these type of, you know, relations are are basically reflected in self-organized groups, informal groups in in at local level. In these local groups, people are taking decisions, building relationships, di distributing roles. And, and this is, in, in fact, this is a practice in democracy and it's building local governance. So I think that nonviolence is, is preserving the democratic values that uh, Ukraine needs for the future of the country. And finally, and my, the last comment, I would, like to, I would like to highlight the interconnection between nonviolence and resilience. Um, the, a successful nonviolence non -violence civil resistance is based on uh, a strong uh, resilience of the society, strong, strong social cohesion. And I think nonviolence was uh, also effective through communication actions, invisible uh, and clandestine actions, the, all the demonstrations that happened in the country, they were able to confront fear and to maintain the unity of the people. So I think that this is also a very interesting intersection, nonviolence and, and, and resilience. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. So hopefully folks are trying to see some of the interconnections, the complementarity, and why it's so critical, why this these practices are so critical to really cultivate a sustainable peace, right? So nonviolent resistance in a way can help shift the power conditions on the ground so that dialogue or negotiations can be more, more fruitful. This process of humanization, so we're better able to really see the needs of the different parties and stakeholders in the conflict. So let's um, go to some of your questions and comments, and then we'll um, give folks a chance to kind of wrap up at the end with any particular ways that they can support your work or kind of these practices in general. So one of the questions is, um, one person is wondering if there, what the, attitude is by um, the Ukrainian government or maybe particular individuals in the government towards nonviolent action? Have you seen any indications of support or programs or investments? Um, what, what have folks picked up there? Well, I can start. Um... Well, one of the main the main um, critics to the to the Ukrainian government is the lack of support to non-violence in the occupied areas. So there was a, a lack of uh, information, lack of practical practical information about how to behave, how to react, you know, under occupation. So the majority of the protection uh, um, uh, activities uh, in, uh, providing uh, you know practical practical uh, you know advices to the people to cross checkpoints and to escape from occupied areas 
came from the civil society, came from also from local organizations or even from non-violent peace force. And so um, I think that this is one of the key problems that the, the Ukraine doesn't rec doesn't recognize, you know, the the strength of of nonviolence and the and the impact nonviolence is. Uh, uh, had, you know, and is having, you know, in the current situation. So I think this is the first critique. The second is that uh, the main focus from the Ukrainian government is, is uh, basically uh, the, the military resistance. They create a center for what they call a center for non-violent, so, so center for natural resistance, which basically uh, co make a confusion between uh, non-violent and, and violent resistance. They put all in, in the same, in the same bag. So it's, it's very, so I think it's also, in my opinion, is a, a way also to basically to maintain the focus on the military resistance and their resistance, and to also to control the the social emancipation forces that are behind nonviolence. Okay? This is also a, this, this decentralized networks. This uh, local power is also a threat to centra the centralized structures in UK. So mm -hmm. it's also very important also to think this double dynamic. One one hand is the you know to fight the invasion, but at the same time also to control these social forces that they are emerging in the society. Yeah, thank you. So really lifting up again this deeper connection between democratic processes and nonviolent action, nonviolent resistance, and peace building. Um, you know, I've talked to a couple individual Ukrainian government officials, and they've. Uh, confided, so to speak, and said, you know, they support different kinds of peace building programs and training and nonviolent skills. And they've offered ideas on how to kind of scale that up. But as kind of a, a whole, as a, as a government, uh, they find it harder to kind of really move things like that forward. So Kalista, there's another question here for you. It says, has there been unarmed civilian accompaniment to food exports from Ukraine? Yeah, um, I'm assuming you mean sort of like the grain being moved by the Black Sea Grain Initiative or that kind of thing. Um, and to my knowledge, there has not. Um, the World Feed Program, a UN agency that manages uh, most of the logistics and moves food for humanitarian assistance, um, does have a history of doing so alongside armed actors sometimes for protection and nonviolent peace force has advocated um, for making a different choice over that because that does um, undermine some of the, the principles of uh, humanitarian um, neutrality and um, you know just it's and also often puts civilians at risk in that way. Um, so I, you know, Nonviolent Peace Force definitely hasn't done it, um, and I haven't heard of others, but it's it's unlikely given the the, the track record. Um, yeah. So certainly, um, the trans transferring of food within the country, right, helping those people who are doing that kind of work be safer, more connected, have the resources. Um, is an element of unarmed protection in this context. Um, so there's another question here, I think for anybody, um, have you identified any opportunities to work with Russians inside or outside of Russia to pursue peace building and nonviolent resistance, unarmed protection? Um, I know that our Ukraine team has been looking for ways to engage in the non-government controlled areas of Ukraine, um, but right now they are not pursuing um, any action within Russia. It's a very, as you know, polarized environment. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it's been a tricky thing, I think, for for all of the humanitarian aid assistance community, the international community of how to, um, yeah, I think the the issue of neutrality and engaging with both sides has been very, very tricky to, to balance, especially given um, 
the attitude of the Russian government towards the aid community. Any other panelists want to comment on that question? Yeah, I would like to add that the, I mean, the, the cooperation with uh, Russian activists are, for example, is happening in the, in the human rights field. So, for example, like uh, organizations like Center for Civil Liberties or the Coalition 5 AM. So, they are working with uh, Russian lawyers to track where are uh, people that were deported, uh, people that are under detention in Rostov, uh, in, in Crimea, or even, uh, you know, in the eastern province of Russia. So this is a, a first cooperation. Then we have a lot of um, uh, youth uh, activists and, and also um, intellectuals that they escaped from, from Russia that they are now in the Baltic countries or on the South Caucasus. They are in these in this, uh, concrete areas. There's a very interesting process ongoing. There are some kind of you know, uh, cooperation process between Belarusians, Rus Ukrainians, and, and Russians. They start to they create spaces for dialogue. Things that they couldn't talk before, they are now talking and, and discussing, you know, in Tbilisi or, or in Vilnius. Um, there are also uh, ongoing, uh, um, for example, this one school of social transformation that we, we participated uh, and in, in Vilnius with more than 100 activists from Belarusian, and the trainers were Ukrainians. So many eyes are from Belarus, from Belarus or from Russia. Many eyes are on on Ukraine because the victory of Ukraine, or the so the basically uh, the uh, um, basically the, that if 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 they manage to 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 stop the invasion, it, it will be some kind of you know inspiration. It will be a strength you know for activists also in other authoritarian regimes like in Belarus or, or Russia. So there are opportunities, especially with the uh, youth movements like Vesna in, in Russia, or the feminist movement in, in, in Russia as well, they're very, very powerful. Of course, they are working in the centralized networks, but I would say yes. And, and I think that this is something that this regional company is very important and critical for the future. Thank you for those examples, Philippe. And again, we're gonna send out a follow-up email with a number of these resources and links to different organizations. Um, I will just flag that there are also a number of Russian uh, defectors from the military and conscientious objectors that have been trying to uh, get out, out not only of the war zone but out of Russia. Some are stuck in Kazakhstan and they're not able to get a, a visa from any country to get to a, a safe a safer country. So this is another piece um, that could be worked on to diminish the ability of Russia to continue with the invasion. So um, We'll have some follow-up opportunities with some of these things. We're coming down to the last few minutes. So I want to give our panelists maybe just one last chance, about 30 seconds or so. Uh, if you have any other comments you want to add, or if you have like one or two ways that people could support uh, the practices that you talked about, um, we welcome you to, to share those. And then we'll close with a final prayer. So Father Mike, are you ready? Thank you. I think one of the important things for us to realize is that a whole generation is traumatized by war. It's not will they be, they are. And uh, how can we respond to this in uh, social theater, Franciscan social theater in particular, is, is one small way uh, that we can begin to start a network and, and reach out further and further to uh, take the first step uh, toward building peace, but that's the long game. And, and the one thing I would say there is uh, part of the difficulties and, and why we are where we are is because people believe peace is the absence of conflict, and it's not. Uh, that's something very different. And the work of peace building broke down and stopped a long time ago in this region. And because it wasn't tended to in a very deliberate way, um, these things happen. Uh, so from my end, I'll just do the classic, pray for us, hope for us, uh, and uh, and let's uh, put our aid as well to the people who are here on the panel and the work that they're doing. Uh, so thank you. It's an honor to be with uh, both of you today. Thank you, Father Mike. And then Kalista uh, or Philippe, about 30 seconds. Kalista? Uh Thank you. I would just say you can go to the Nonviolent Peace Force website or you can 
um, donate or you can sign up for the newsletter and become part of the community and learn more about our work and the different ways to support it. And most of all, I would just encourage everyone, as I'm sure, you know, you're part of this network, so I think you already consider yourselves um, local peace builders because we talk about how we support them in other countries and wherever we are, like we are those local peace builders who can have the most impact. And I think that um, when we help shape a more peaceful community around us right where we are, that has a ripple effect that goes out. So while we focus on these other places that have these um, these big crises, uh, sometimes there's just only so much we can do to that, but we can at the same time attend to our own communities and the own, our own ways to increase peace amongst them. Thank you. And Philippe? Yeah, very fast. So I, I think that the festival, I think um, political recognition and, and, and also economic support to nonviolent activists, um, so those ones they have been you know, on the front line of, uh, uh, of, of the resistance. Um, then I think this is very interesting also to explore the city to city cooperation, especially the, those areas uh, in, in the liberated areas that are trying to, uh, to increase social recovery and reconstruction. And then I think also the, the idea of uh, help the helpers or so people that were also, you know, especially women activists that they were uh, dealing and with the protection uh, actions. Also, they need also to, they, they wanted also, in fact, you know, uh, to, to go out to other countries for training, you know, for. Uh, different type of activities, but also to um, to breathe a bit, you know, from all this uh, situation. So I will start here. Thank you so much, everyone. You are all amazing. We will pray for you and hopefully find ways to be in touch and to support. Uh, we have a Congress here in the U.S. that could hear from people about supporting peace building, supporting nonviolent resistance, supporting unarmed protection, both in what they say and what they invest in. And we know our Pope is calling for diplomacy and negotiations, so we encourage folks to support his efforts as well. Michelle, you want to wrap us up in a closing prayer? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Dunn, Executive Director of Franciscan Action Network. Um, this is a prayer for world peace. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague, Sister Louise Lears, for bringing it to me. And the author is unknown. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray for the power to be gentle, the strength to be forgiving, the patience to be understanding, and the endurance to accept the consequences of holding on to what we believe is right. May we put our trust in the power of good to overcome evil and the power of love to overcome hatred. We pray for the vision to see and the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence, a new world where fear shall no longer lead men or women to commit injustice, nor selfishness make them bring suffering to others. Help us devote our whole lives and thought and energy to the task of making peace, praying always for the inspiration and the power to fulfill the destiny for which we and all women and men were created. Amen. Before we leave, uh, I want to thank Eli for this webinar, uh, and uh, I want to thank our institutional members whose generosity has made Eli's fellowship with FAN possible. Just to mention a few upcoming events, we will be having another webinar on peace in Ukraine organized by Eli that will focus on diplomacy uh, in a few weeks. You'll hear back from us about that. We have coming up on June 28th, uh, the annual FAN benefit that will focus on Franciscan care for and solidarity with the impoverished and the unhoused among us in the United States. And also on peace building here in the United States, we want to encourage you and we will give you the link to participate in a novena um, for this is against gun violence. And it's launched by a newly formed coalition of women religious nuns against gun violence. This is a novena leading up to the National Gun Violence Awareness Day on June 2nd and we uh, encourage you to participate in events around that. Thank you to all of our speakers and to all of our participants. 
Uh, and we wish you peace and all good from the Franciscan Action Network.